something's happening on Tuesday. Does anybody know what it is? You don't know? Are any of you going anywhere on Tuesday? No, maybe you're not, Danielle, but I know some of these boys are going somewhere, and Krista's going somewhere on Tuesday. Where are you going? You have to wake up early. Yeah, we, yeah, but this isn't a picnic. <laughs> this isn't a picnic. It's something that you have to do. Just, yeah, we're going next week, but on Tuesday, some of these people are going somewhere that they haven't been all summer. Where are you going? You better remember. <laughs> I'll give you a hint. You might be taking one of these with you. Where do you think you're going with this? To school. You're right. <laughs> well, it sounds like you guys aren't too worried about going back to school. But sometimes children have lots of worries about the first day of school. School. They wonder if they'll have any friends in their class. They wonder if they'll be able to do the work in a new grade. They wonder if um, they'll like their teacher. They just, they worry about a whole bunch of things. And Sean Hoy, I want you to come up here for a minute. And see how all these worries feel on, can you turn around and I'm going to put this on your back. How, that's all those worries about school. How does that feel? <laughs> Is it heavy? Mm, I don't think so. You don't think so? Well, I think it's heavy. <laughs> but if we take out our worries, how do you think we can get rid of our worries? And you know, I want to tell you a secret about worries. You know who's worrying more about school than you guys? Your teachers. I have two daughters that are teachers, but every day I talk to them now, they're worried about something. One daughter told me, I didn't sleep last night. Mom, I had this dream that I didn't do something right at school, and some poor little girl was in trouble. So your teachers worry too. But if we start saying to God, Oh, Pastor Mantle has a big backpack, and I have a lot of books in here somewhere, and i got to find the zipper for it. <laughs> but if we, okay, and then I'm going to get you to try the back. If we start giving those worries to go, these worries about who our teacher is, what we're going to wear on the first day, can we do the work? Now put this back. How does it feel now? lighter. <laughs> yeah. He's a very strong boy if you didn't feel that that was heavy. Anyway, we need to give our worries to God. And sometimes it's the big people that have the hardest. Yes, and we all need to give our worries to God. And the Bible tells us, well, I'm glad you're not worried. Yeah. Okay, and the Bible tells us, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. So we all need to give our worries to God. So let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for how you take care of us. And help us, Lord, not to worry about things but to turn our worries over to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. The Gospel according to John. Again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You are bearing witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered them and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You people judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I and he who sent me. 
Even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. And so they were saying to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. He said therefore again to them, I go away and you shall seek me and shall die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Therefore the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. And he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore to you that you shall die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And so they were saying to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, what have, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Jesus therefore said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he went, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Archie. It's good to travel sometimes um, and see faraway places, experience some new sights and sounds, and perhaps some of you over the summer have had that chance, or may, uh, in the days to come. On a trip, you can learn something new or to discover something familiar, um, or, or where something familiar originated. And when you come back, you may have a better appreciation for the richness and the character, not just of where you visited, but also of home. Those of you who did have a chance to get away somewhere this summer, did you um, come back with uh, a fresh perspective and a deeper insight um, about life, about yourself, about the world maybe? Travel can do that. But travel is not just about physical movement. You can travel into new regions of thought and experience through books and through study and education, through learning. With the start of school on Tuesday, students and teachers are setting out on an exciting trip of discovery to new lands or old lands in science, mathematics, art, history, geography, languages, and a personal favorite of mine, biology. It would be a shame if the rest of us were left out by not continuing our own journeys of learning and growth. So just because you may not be going back to school is not an excuse. Uh, can you read? Can you learn? You can, of course, and we should always uh, be continuing to do that. Some years ago, Heather and I went to visit um, my brother Wes and his wife and family in England. Um, they were living just outside London at the time, and so it made a perfect opportunity for us to uh, have a place to stay and to visit them and also see some sights. And while there, we had the opportunity of seeing St. Paul's Cathedral. The original church on this site was founded way back in the year 604. But the present building dates from the late 1600s. It was designed by Sir Christopher Wren in the English Baroque style. And it remains the tallest. Um, well, actually, it remains the largest. Put it that way. It remains the largest Protestant cathedral in the world, even today. 
Inside, you can climb stairs to a circular balcony near the pinnacle where the city stretches before you 280 feet below. Its spires, though, continue on farther up from there to a height of 365 feet, um, one foot for every day of the year. In fact, um, it was Christopher Wren's son who laid the final stone to complete the project uh, as his father was now uh, so old he, he couldn't do it. One of the reasons I wanted to go to St. Paul's on that visit was to see the famous picture of William Holman Hunt. Uh, you've heard of it, you've probably seen it. It's called The Light of the World. The original painting was um, painted about the year 1853. And it's, the original is on display at Oxford University. But this, larger, this large life-size copy is um, in St. Paul's. It was painted later, and before coming to reside in St. Paul's, uh, it, was, it was taken on a worldwide tour. And as I stood um, those years ago in the dim light of St. Paul's before the great painting, you know, I was a little disappointed. I'd wanted to see it, uh, but when I got there and I'm standing there in the dim shadows and seeing the, I was a bit disappointed because you couldn't really see it that well in the subdued illumination. I imagine that the light was purposely kept low to preserve the painting from deteriorating. That's probably the idea for why the lights were so low. But I think there's probably a parable here. Here we have a beautiful picture of Christ, the light of the world. It's preserved. It's hanging in the shadows of a cathedral. Once it was on a worldwide tour, viewed to great acclaim by thousands of people, but now it has come to rest, admittedly in a place of honor, but not one where its beauty is best displayed or its message reaches the multitude for whom it was intended. Hmm. In the, dim, in the dim recesses of the cathedral, it would be quite possible, in fact, to walk by this painting without really noting that it was even there. It would be very easy to miss it altogether. In contrast, uh, today's scripture opens with Jesus making the dramatic declaration, I am the light of the world. The occasion is the Feast of Tabernacles that we've been um, watching Jesus' attendance at in Jerusalem. And previously we noted uh, Jesus' invitation when he said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And we talked about that. And we remarked that this was made in the context of a water pouring ritual, which remembered and gave thanks to God for his provision of rain. But there's another significant part of this feast um, of Tabernacles, and it concerns a ceremony um, called the illumination in the temple. Here is how commentator William Barclay describes that ceremony. On the evening of its first day, there was a ceremony called the illumination of the temple. It took place in the court of the women. The court was surrounded with deep galleries erected to hold the spectators. In the center, four, four great candelabra were prepared. When the dark came, the four great candelabra were lit. And it was said that they sent such a blaze of light throughout Jerusalem that every courtyard was lit up by its brilliance. In the Old Testament, God is associated with light. The first command at creation is, let there be light. The light streaming from the temple, piercing the darkness, visible from afar, is a powerful symbol of God's presence. Now with that picture fresh in their minds, Jesus makes his dramatic pronouncement. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now that's a, clearly an amazing claim. You can write it off as the ravings of a lunatic, the crazed ramblings of a madman, Except Jesus' manner of dealing with people and his compassion, his, his reason, his intellectual um, honesty, his wisdom, all of these things deny that 
he is crazy. So what are we to make of the statement then? Without apology, as it rings with universality and absoluteness, absoluteness, I am the light of the world. What are we to do with that? How do we to understand it? Well, it means, of course, many things. But to be the light of the world, as contrasted simply with a light, it must answer some basic questions. It must, in fact, answer the basic questions of life. There are dark corners in life common to human experience. The light of the world, to fulfill its title, must surely, at a minimum, illumine these dark corners of the world, revealing and making sense of them, revealing and making sense of what has been shrouded in darkness. Human beings, uh, human hearts, ask in unison and are confounded by three great mysteries. These are questions we all have and have to come to terms with. They are life's questions in every place and time. Here they are. Where do I come from and where am I going? That's the question of origin and destiny. Where do I come from? Where am I going? The second question, who am I? That's the question of identity. Adolescents, young people struggle with this, but we all struggle with it throughout our lives. Who am I really? And finally, what am I here for? That's the question of purpose. What's my mission in life? What gives significance to my being here? For Jesus to be the light of the world, he must know the answer to these questions, first of all, for himself. How can he answer them for us if he couldn't answer them for himself? If he can't answer them personally, uh, then uh, we can presume that he doesn't have the answers for our case. But how interesting it is in his discussion with the Pharisees, Jesus appears as someone who knew with great confidence and assurance where he had come from and where he was going. He knew who he was, and he knew why he was here. He knew what he had come to do, what his purpose was. The Pharisees challenged the validity of Jesus' claim to be the light of the world as he was testifying, they said, concerning himself. They said, that doesn't count. You're talking about yourself. You, that, that, um, that's not true. But Jesus countered, stating that he knew where he came from and where he was going. As no one else, Jesus understood the, his own origin and his destiny. His opening lines, the, John's opening lines in the Gospel of John attest to this, um, to this beginning, where we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. That's speaking to Jesus' origins. Jesus preserved, perceived clearly what was in store for Him as well. He told His disciples before it happened what was coming, but what had never even crossed their minds, what they couldn't imagine, and even when he told them, they had a hard time believing. He told the Pharisees also, you have no idea where I came from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I'm going away, and where I go, you cannot come. As humans, uh, we perceive a limited part of the picture. We are born and we live out the first part of our lives before consciousness arises and peers forwards and backwards. At first we just live in a little narrow place called the present. Grow up with our moms and dads and happy to, to play and, and, um, and be in their care. But come to age 12, 13, 14, we began to look back and see that we've grown up to this stage. We began to look ahead and, and, and I, imagine, I can remember about the age of 12 or 13 realizing for the first time that one day my parents would die. And I can remember being sad at that realization. I, and I, there was, they weren't sick. There's no sense that they were, anything was close. But I remember realizing way back then that one day my parents will die. So, with that st so our consciousness opens up things for us a little bit. And we see a little bit back, a little bit forward.
In his play, As You Like It, Shakespeare unerringly traces the landscape that comes into view. Here's the big picture that we all uh, have to come to terms with. All the world is a stage, and all the men and the women on it merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. His acts being seven ages, at first the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like a snail, unwillingly to school. <laughs> and then the lover, sighing like a furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. And then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation. Even in the cannon's mouth, and then the justice. In fair round belly, with good cape and lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose. I think I'm probably about the sixth age. With spectacles on nose and pouch on side. I won't turn sideways. His youthful hose well saved a world too wide for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice turning back again toward childish treble pipes and whistles in his sound. And then the last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. But Jesus, the light of the world, illumines the darkness beyond the present stage, beyond that beginning when we were born, looking back. And then beyond even our death to what comes after that. When, for us, the curtain falls, what is the next act in our play? Jesus was secure in his knowledge of his identity a child's self-awareness arises out of his relation to his parents. It is enough for them to know as a child, I am my daddy's little boy or I am my mother's little girl. That's enough. Jesus was certain of his identity and relationship with God. He knew that God was his father. And he came to reveal and to restore the relationship with God, which is our true identity, where our identity rests. That also is who we ultimately are. The smudges of sin in our faces obscure the holy image of God. And so Jesus draws near with his lamp to reveal beneath the dirt, deeply loved and painstakingly sought, sons and daughters of God. Don't ever doubt your value your dignity, your worth. In Christ, we are sons and daughters of God. And thirdly, Jesus was absolutely clear concerning his purpose. He told them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be. He's saying that's where you'll know and see it and be convinced Jesus dying on the cross wasn't a tragic miscalculation, a wrong turn with deadly consequences. Calvary was his destination all along. He told his disciples beforehand as they were going up to Jerusalem, and this they didn't want to hear or even understand, but he told them, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Ransom is something, it is used to buy something, to buy someone back. We talk about it in terms of kidnappers, don't we? You give a ransom to the kidnapper to get your child or to get the person who's been kidnapped back. Jesus was a ransom by which God bought back, bought our freedom, if you like, from sin. And Jesus' fixed purpose, faithfully carried out to completion, not only obliterates the darkness and lostness 
that we ha that we that are our inheritance, but it actually ignites and lights the pathway of purpose in our lives too. Our course and identity are also intertwined with purpose. God means us, our lives to count for something, that it matters that we lived, that something was accomplished through our being in this world. We have a role to play, furthering and sharing in the mission of spreading his light. The picture in Revelation shows Jesus walking among the lampstands. The lampstands are the churches. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Our church is to be a light in our city. And each of us in our own place are to be a light. Let your light so shine before men, Jesus said, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We shouldn't be following the world as it, it catches up and, and realizes, oh, there's people out there that need help. Oh, and the church shakes itself, so I guess we better do something too. We should be out ahead, leading. Christ's light shining in our hearts answers as nothing else can do the question, what am I here for? If anyone would come after me, Jesus said, he must deny himself, take up their cross, his cross, her cross, and follow me. Jesus didn't sugarcoat it. Contrary to both human inclination and the ever-present intimations of advertisers with something to sell, happiness is not found in the granting of our wishes and the feeding of our desires. You can follow that course and forever and ever and ever, and then you'll never be full. You never be satisfied. Oh, maybe for a moment, uh, a day, a two, and then the shine goes off and you, something else is needed. Rather, satisfaction and fulfillment in life are discovered on the Calvary road of sacrifice. That's what Jesus wants to teach us. Sharing his company and sharing his purpose. Walking along with him, not to save our lives, but to lay them down, to give them up, to pour them out, and to spend them fully for God. That's meaning, that's significance, and that's ultimately satisfaction. And that's the narrow path that Jesus, lamp in hand, would lead us along. In the light of a dark world, he comes to our door, this stranger from another place. The door is shut tight, overgrown with weeds. If it is dark on the outside, imagine how dark it is on the inside in that house, behind that fast closed door. And the stranger knocks on the door and asks for admittance, says, can I come in? In fact, he says, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. He says, I want to sit down at the table with you. I want to fellowship with you. And there is the table. Purchased at great cost. And to those who will grant him admittance into their church, into his church, into their lives, into our lives, Jesus brings the light that answers life's most pressing questions. Where do we come from? Where are we going? What are we here for? As we sit down to dine, the answers he gives and the answer he is fills us up and satisfies our hunger real fine. Real fine. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we uh, bow before you. Our dark world needs your light. Our lives need your light. We thank you that you came, that you knocked on the door, are knocking even today, asking for fresh admittance. Light, Lord, shine in our hearts. And spill over out the windows. 
into the neighborhoods and the streets and the city and the world. Help us to realize the tremendous privilege it is to come to this table that you provided. But also, Lord, the responsibility that goes with it as we share these gifts and understand that they are not just for us alone. We pray in your own precious name, Jesus. Amen.